Okay, so today I want to give a presentation about the value of predictive analytics for early disease prevention um, in global health. Um, so since I don't have a medical background, I thought it's helpful in the beginning to actually know where I'm coming from and what my research is about. So here's an overview of what I'm um, dealing with in my um, daily research and everything I'm doing kind of connects to, to the question about how can we make the best decisions possible um, and how can we make the best decisions possible using data. And there are two research streams that I'm considering, and one is on the left hand side is operations research, and the other one is analytics. And both of them have the same goal to help you with making the best decisions, but they are approaching that from different um, perspectives. And I hope the picture helps you a tiny bit to understand where they are each coming from. So with operations research, it has like a really mathematical background, and we're always trying to look at the problem and look at different parts of a problem. That's why I put here like those different shapes of rectangles. So we're looking at different parts of the problem um, and try to understand um, what applies to looking at these um, problems itself and then try to combine it together to have um, some information about what the best decision is. So usually with operations research, we're dealing with a lot of simulation systems. We have questions of um, optimal solutions, about maximizing and minimizing, and we're interested in probabilities and statistics. And then analytics on the other side also has the goal to make the best decisions possible, but here we are using um, a lot of data. And with analytics, usually we are dealing with a lot of method data in the beginning that we need to deal with. So there's like a close link to exploring this data first in analytics um, before we can actually do the uh, more interesting things, which is predicting and clustering so learning something from the data that we can apply to a new thing. So these are the two research themes, and within the talk first, um, I will focus on the operations research part, and then later I will give you an outlook um, on, on my um, perspective on analytics um, in prevention of disease. So since I'm not having um, a medical background, there are still like a lot of um, overlap with medical um, research questions. Um, and the topic that I want to use today for this talk are variables, and probably um, some of you are wearing a wearable or already um, heard about that these wearables have probably a huge value in, in the medical context. Um, and that is because they're not like only able to show you like what time is it, but they They are like able to collect a lot of vital signs from people whenever they are um, wearing a wearable. Um, and in the past years, we've seen a lot of news and research articles all dealing with smartwatch data and how we can use this data to prevent, for example, mental diseases, to prevent um, heart attacks, to prevent falling in elderly and so on. So there are a lot of examples in newspapers. Um, and today we want to use this example to see how can we actually decide what is the value of having such a tool that is able to prevent all of the diseases that we have. So how can we actually assess the value of um, predictive methods for, for presenting and research? And here I want to use the example um, of the Slovenia um, patients, uh, which I learned from a colleague, which is really um, hard and challenging for patients that are suffering from schizophrenia. So usually a patient that has schizophrenia has during, um, during the life several relapses. These are um, the red spikes here. Um, and during the relapses, patients suffer from, from negative and positive uh, symptoms. Most popular is having a paranoia. Um, and when there is a relapse, usually patients um, stay in the hospital for, you will see there's a huge span of how many days there is usually per relapse between 30 and 489. We come back later to this one. So whenever there is a relapse, the patient has to stay for a long time in the hospital and is suffering from all those symptoms. So there's a huge impact on the quality of the patient's um, life. This is the one side. And then the other side, since I'm coming from an economic background, is that we do have to pay a lot of money for treating those patients. Here's an example number that is usually around like $1 million um, over a patient's lifetime. So we see we have with the case of schizophrenia is one example. We have patients that are suffering a lot from, from schizophrenia, and then we are also having a lot of money um, that is needed to treat these patients. So this is a good example then to think about so what would happen now if we had like um, the perfect prevention method, for example, having a rare
terrible the patients were, and that could that we had like um, smaller costs overall, but also that we could increase um, the patient quality. So how can we actually put like some numbers on this on how much money we could save and how much we could um, increase the patient quality of life? So I told you in the beginning already that one tool that we are using is simulation, and that's also what we did here um, in the case. So with simulation, we are always trying to build a model that is as close as possible to the reality, or at least um, has like all the factors um, from, from the disease that um, are needed to get like um, a simulation or a model um, for this. So what we were doing here, for example, is we're thinking of we have one patient in the beginning, and this patient can have several characteristics. For example, what are the symptoms right now? Um, is the patient adherent to therapy? Is there a risk associated with the patient? And then we are interested in what are the costs and the patient quality and value for the patient um, for each day in the simulation. Um, and then we were considering a uh, making difference between we do have a patient that is in relapse, so having this red spike again. So we were considering what are the costs per day in relapse and also the patient quality. And then also afterwards, we will have a patient that is in remission. Um, and again, consider how many costs and values do we have. And then this patient in our simulation would change from having a relapse, have a transition, going to the remission, and then go back to the relapse. And this would be the world. And the advantage of using those kind of models is that the model doesn't care for how many patients we are doing this. Um, the model doesn't care for what time we are doing this, and the model also doesn't care how many scenarios we want to uh, test using the simulation, so we can really play around. Um, with this simulation, we tested it for uh, 10,000 patients over the period of 15 years to see which effect we can see. Um, and yeah, 10,000 patients over the course of 15 years would be really challenging to do that with uh, real people, obviously. Um, so having this one, this first setting helps us in understanding what is actually a benchmark that we can use. So how many, um, what is the life quality of a patient itself in this setting? And what are the costs that we have after those 15 years and so on? And what we are interested in is what happens actually if we do have this wonder solution, for example, the wearable, um, that is able to prevent some of our relapses. So our patients go so not directly back to the relapse, but there is a chance that we can keep the patients longer um, in remission. And this is what we want to focus on today on the green part here, how much money can we actually save here and how much can we increase the patient's quality of life. So to do this, what we need to do is like, at least we need some numbers that we uh, start from, and this is usually called uh, finding um, a benchmark for these simulation scenarios. And here you can see the benchmark that we implemented in our simulation. And this is an example for Germany. So what you need to do when you want to build such a simulation, you first need to look up, so what are reasonable the numbers that we can feed into our solution? And here you can see we already found like different sources that all um, come up with different numbers. So sometimes it's not so easy to know what is the exact um, right number that we want to put here. Um, we came up uh, based on what we found in the research on three different scenarios. In the first one, we assumed that there is a low burden. Um, for patients in the economic with uh, very short or shorter compared to the other scenarios around 33 days and um, then we assume longer days in remission here about 400 and then we assume per day in relapse and per day in remission um, cost and then we also came up with a medium burden and a high burden uh, which has a lot longer assumes a lot longer days in relapse and also um, for shorter days for remission but also higher costs. So you see here, it's also like challenging finding the right numbers. And one thing that is then the solution is always like thinking of a range. So what is the smallest number that we can find? OK, so using these numbers, the first step is always to come up with a benchmark scenario. So we had our simulation for 10,000 patients um, over the course of the 15 years. Um, and after the 15 years, which take like two minutes in our simulation, um, we can look into the numbers and see, okay, what would have happened if this would have been like 15 years um, in life to, to the patient and also to the patient. 
um, we were looking at the quality adjusted life years um, of patients, which is a common uh, measure to know what's the quality that a patient has. So we were considering 15 years, and we see in the low burden scenario, on average, patients had out of these 15 years, eight years um, of high quality, and the others not. And then we see with the medium burden and the high burden. It's and then with costs, we can see on average per patient in the low burden scenario, we would pay 230,000 um, euro per patient. And then in the medium burden scenario, it's almost um, already a, a million. And then in the high burden, it's way over. A then we see on average in the low burden scenario, we assume that a, a patient has 19 relapses and then 10 relapses here um, and seven relapses in the high burden. To remember, we do have more relapses here in the low burden scenario. However, they are way shorter, only of around 33 days. Um, whereas in the medium burden and high burden scenario, those um, re uh, days spent in relapses are lacking. Okay, so now I highlighted that we already found like five publications that talk about which numbers we could feed into our simulation only for Germany. So what happens if you want to translate to, that to another country? Sometimes it's not easy to find um, the benchmarks there. Um, so I brought you some numbers about what is the share of population in the world with schizophrenia, but also what is the public healthcare expenditure um, in, in all the countries in the world. Um, so what happens if you now want to do something, uh, let's say for the United States, and you don't find any research, well then you can roughly compare based on the colors where you would expect the United States, and then you see since it's similar to Germany, probably you can assume a similar setting to what I've showed you on the previous page. Um, but also when you see, look for the yellow countries, you will see, okay, probably there is a different setting. Um, or even worse, when you see for some countries there's no data available at all, um, then you just need to do a lot more scenarios than we did here. So we had now our three scenarios since we found like literature based for these ones. The more unsure you are about like what the right values are, the more scenarios you need to conduct to actually what the effects Okay, this is an example of what happens within our simulation. So here's the example of one patient over the course of 15 years. So each row that you see here now is exactly one year of the patient. Um, and this is in the low burden scenario. And uh, the pink bars um, are always the, um, the times where the patient is relapsed, and the blue bars is always the patient. And what we can see here, so the patient has like several relapses, um, and there is like some blue spots in between where the patient. And if we compare that now to the medium scenario, then it already looks a lot different. So we see a lot more pink, so a lot more days the patient spent um, in relapse, but we also see some years here in between. Then for the high burden scenario, you see that now almost everything is pink and it's a lot harder to find like the blue spots here in between um, since we even think of uh, longer relapses or more days and relapses in the hybrid. And now we are interested in what happens if we had like a tool that is able to prevent some of the relapses. So for example, what happens if we had a tool that is able to prevent 50% of these relapses. And then we can see for the first example in uh, the low burden scenario, we can see we do have a lot less blue. So we can see like just by looking at the pictures, we do see a lot less um, of those pink relapses here. So um, preventing 50% of those relapses already has. However, if we look at the next picture for the medium scenario, then we see it's not so easy. I don't know what you were expecting, but I was expecting to see something more here. However, it's still a lot pink here, so the patient spends still a lot of time in, in, in the relapse, um, which is because we deal with a lot of um, with worse relapses, the patients with longer periods um, in, in, in the relapse. So uh, apparently a prevention of 50% doesn't make that much difference. And then we do see something similar with the high scenario. Um, here we can also see we do still have like a lot of pink, so the patient is still suffering a lot from the relapses. So also the same one, the prevention of 50% doesn't have the same effect here um, as in the low um, burden. And try to keep that picture in mind because this is like one insight um, for the prevention of 50%. But we tested that, of course, for like um, different um, different settings for the prevention, um, which you can see on this. And I marked in uh, pink where we just talked about the one um, example that you know where this one was. 
um, was located in this place. And what we did here was we compared to what was now um, the quality um, from, from our patient on the life during those 50 years that we considered in the simulation and what were the costs that we had. Um, and did we see any change compared to the benchmark that we have by um, introducing some prevention methods. And you see um, on the y-axis, we always compare to the benchmark how much we improve the quality of the patient and here in this figure how much we can increase the cost. And then on the x-axis, you see um, for which kind of uh, prevention probability um, this uh, belongs to. So for example, we had the example of 50% prevention probability, which is here. And then you see we tested it also for like prevention of 10% of the relapses, 30%. Okay, so the first thing, uh, and the lines, if I forget it, so the lines um, represent the different scenarios. Low burden scenario, the medium, and the high burden. Okay, so the first one uh, thing that we can see, which is nice, is that having uh, prevention, of course, pays off, but which is also nice, is like we, if we introduce some prevention, the costs go down and also the quality of the patient will increase. Um, so both of these goals work in the direction, which is helpful. Um, then, for example, um, from the 50% probability, we can see a relative um, save and cost of around 20% for the low, bur low burden scenario, um, around 6% for the medium, and about 3.6% um, for the high burden. Then, um, if we just look at the line of the low burden scenarios, then we can see that there's almost like a linear relationship. So, whenever we go like a few steps here to the right, prevention probability, we almost go like the same amount here um, in the relative increase. So it's almost like um, a perfect line that we see here. So in the low burden scenario, the more tiny bit of percentage we are able to increase the prevention probability, this already pays. However, for the medium and high burden scenarios, and this is what you've already also seen on the previous picture, where there was still a lot of things, we don't see those effects already at the um, low numbers for being able to prevent some of the relapses, but we are only able to see them at the higher numbers. So for example, uh, the line is starting to rise here from 70% and the same at the top. So what does that mean? Um, and here I wanted to remember that we were comparing here the relative values. However, if we translate these to absolutes, so for example, euro values, um, then those three um, spots here save the exact same money. Um, so um, don't get fooled by the relative uh, perspective here, and this means for each of the patients here, um, we can save um, 50,000 um, euros, um, which also gives you an idea about like how much money we could actually put into those prevention solutions um, if we can save in the end 50,000 um, euros. And then worth noting, the more we are able to um, increase this prevention probability, the more money we save or could use to, um, to increase our prevention probability. And also, of course, like increase uh, the quality of the patient where there is not even like a number um, on, on you as we put. put. Okay, so this was an overview from the operation research perspective. So now is the question, um, how good can actually predictive models prevent diseases? And remember, so for today, um, I'm using the example of um, wearable data. Um, and here I brought like an overview of what those wearables are right now able to track with vital signs. So you can see wearables are able to measure the temperature, for example, the oxygen, the heart rate, the number of steps, the steps of patient recovery, and so on. And then I told you in the beginning that many um, people are already interested in how to use this data and that this data is right now used to make um, predictions. So on the right hand side, you will find some uh, publications. So if you're interested into this one, just read through them and see how they use um, the data. I put like some errors. So for example, um, you see like um, some of the research considered um, the active time of patients during the day from the variables who were able to predict the sleep quality from patients. So this is quite promising having a lot of data at hand and then using it to make any predictions and then in the end being able to prevent um, some diseases. Um, but I will give you like some challenges solely from a data perspective of why I think we're not um, there yet. So here's the very rough picture of how um, learning with data um, works, um, or just like an example of visual. 
So what we're usually doing is we're collecting a lot of data points. So here you see like all the data points and then what we're having when we're doing um, any analytics um, algorithm. So like applying machine learning to this one, when we want to learn something out of this one, we look at all the data points um, and let the algorithm decide what, for example, would be like the best line to describe all the data we have seen from historical data from patients that we have used. And then once we have this, so we have like all the historical data and then we have like um, some prediction like this line here. And um, then we can use this for a new unseen patient that we didn't know before and compare the data we have from this new patient to what we've seen in the past. So if this would be possible, this would allow us to study like many problems in medicine okay, because it's quite easy to give uh, wearables to a lot of patients. Um, so we can monitor our patients um, at low cost, which would also mean that solutions are possibly available to everyone since they're very cheap. Um, and in the long run, this would also help us to allocate healthcare um, capacity more efficiently. But now I want to um, show you three examples on why we are not there yet and why this is like super challenging. So the first one is data bias. So usually or sometimes I hear it when I talk to people and that I'm dealing with data, then I get like the feeling that people think data tells the truth and this is um, not true at all. Um, so with data, you always need to be careful of what you're actually feeding into your model. Um, and there's always the risk of um, having um, a huge data bias in your model. Um, on the left hand side, I showed you, I brought you a picture of how many people on the world are actually um, using a mobile phone. I couldn't find one for wearables, but I thought it's like something similar. And here I just want to show you, um, so a lot of people on the world have access to a mobile phone, which is a good thing and which could probably help us also handing out wearables and allows us to monitor people all over the world. Um, so this could be something to provide fair access to the solutions that we are building. However, the data that we are collecting from each, um, for example, from each one of the countries is highly um, diverse. So here's an example of activity um, from, from a research study in 2019. And the colors depict how high the inequality is in the activity. And then you see the countries are large and when there is more obesity than in other countries. So for example, in the US, you see there's like high um, activity inequality in all the lot of the people. So what happens now, if you want to use this data and want to predict anything, we need to consider that we do have a lot of inequality in the US if we want to find a solution in the US. And then where do you start? Where do you stop? You also need to think about like what are uh, different genders, different cultures, and then in the end also about like different pieces. So you really need to think about like what is the data um, that we are collecting before you can um, create any algorithms that make decisions. And when you will read through the um, research studies that I showed two slides ago, you will see what happens nowadays is like we took 20 patients and tried to come up with a prediction model and then they even come up with prediction models. However, it's questionable how good this can be transferred to new settings. Then the second one um, is um, so usually when you think of smartwatches with variables, what comes to your mind is probably the Apple Watch or some Samsung watches and so on. And these are the watches that most people are wearing. Um, however, all of these devices are developed by private companies. So how can we actually um, know that what they are measuring are the correct values as these uh, private companies make a huge secret of uh, which technology they are building and also like which sensors they are building with inside um, their watch. So handing out, out one of these uh, wearables to a patient, um, how can we actually know that the value is correct? Well, one possibility is like we did here um, in, in this study, is compare the values that we see um, from those smartwatches with some patients compared to a gold standard that is available. Um, on the left hand side, we did this for the heart rate and on the right hand side for the oxygen saturation to see and gain some trust if the values that we get out of the smartwatches are actually the right ones to make any uh, predictions. And the downside of this is here's Apple Watch 6. I don't even know like which is um, the most recent version, probably it's already seven and next year it will be eight and so on. So it's always like we always need to test like the new models if we want to use them and see if the data that comes out is really valuable data um, that we can use. And then lastly is about um, that we don't know um, the ground truth actually from um, what we are collecting with and this is like a huge thing. So usually when we want to predict something, 
we need some data set on which we can learn from and this data set also has to include like some targets. For example, we're making predictions of will a customer come back and for which amount will the customer buy. So then the model needs to learn for which amount did a customer buy in the past. However, handing out variables to patients is nice that we can hand out a lot of variables, but we don't really know what the ground rules of those um, patients. And here's an example of a um, study we did where we handed out two types of variables to depressive um, patients and um, where we evaluated the number of daily steps. Um, during that time period. And the idea is that usually people suffering from depression often lose interest in everyday activities. So you could look for uh, any patterns in the data um, that show you that there is like less activity, which could give you a hint and help you predict about that those um, patients. So if you look at the data, so here you see like all the patients that we had, and then you see um, darker colors are higher activity and the lighter the colors are the less activity. And just by looking at the picture, you would then, this is what the algorithm is doing better than just by us looking with our eyes, but still, um, you could just look for like where there are like times that we do have less two. And then you could come up with something like, okay, we do see, for example, four patients here um, that have less activity. So uh, we see this patient here is moving a lot around here, but not in the first weeks. And here we see some priority. And also here we do see less activity. So now is the question, does that already is that already enough to say that this patient um, is depressive? Probably not. And also, like another information I didn't give you until now is that we collected this data during the COVID pandemic. Um, so it's highly likely that during that period that people stayed at home for 14 days, being quarantined or even sick from COVID, which totally changes the picture of what we were actually looking for in the beginning. So if we want to hand out a lot of variable data to patients, we do get a lot of data, but we still don't know if the data, I mean, the data tells some truth, but we don't know which of the truth the data is. So what we actually need is user input that helps us about, so your watch collected, if you weren't sleeping well, did you actually did not sleep well, and then we need a user to put in, yes, no. The same with the steps, so we see that you didn't take as many steps, what happened here, can you give us some user input? And again, we could hand out a lot of variables. However, since we do need the user and the user input, this limits again the scalability of the data that we can collect overall. Okay, overall, um, so this was the picture I showed you in the beginning, and I just try to organize what we found out here in the talk around the picture. So first, what we did is using a simulation model, and we see using the simulations can help us show the effect that we have, for example, on the patient's quality life as well as the host, um, the cost when we think about implementing a preventive method. But we could also see that um, probably, or what I hope for, is that if we verify the benefits of those prevention digital tools within these simulation models, that this should have an impact on speed of regulation, funding, development, and so on. So not just talking about the idea, but also putting exact numbers there that if we are successful, we are able to save that much uh, money. But also this gives you like an insight on how good do we need to actually be. So you've seen the example of 50% prediction quality, which was enough for the low burden scenario, but also needs to be better for the medium and high burden. And then from the analytics perspective, I talked about that variables enable studying diseases or could enable studying diseases at large scale, and we could be able to um, collect a lot of data here. Um, however, collecting a lot of data and making predictions out of this data requires a lot of data and also required a lot of valid, labeled, and context-specific data, which is really hard um, and challenging to prove. And you can also see here on the analytics side that um, now these boxes are more on the right hand side where it is about like, collecting the data and this is also where I see the challenge in the future. We do have a lot of good methods to work with the data. However, the higher challenges are in actually collecting these data from the patients to make any decisions about preventing them. Okay, I hope I was slightly in time. Thank you all for listening. This is some advertisement from a university. I just said in the beginning, you're all welcome to visit me. It's really nice there. The beach is not as big um, as it looked like here. And also then thanks a lot for all my um, colleagues who are put here, who also put the research um, together with me there at the dentist.